All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our weekly conference call with Uprint and Red Earth. Matt Ham here, co-founder of Uprint. Uh, we are a faith and personal development organization, and we really focus on helping individuals and organizations really thrive in excellence and innovation as a part of their life, their business, their culture. And we do that through kind of a very specific approach with content, using digital technology, in-person relationships, um, and, and bringing a faith-based perspective to the table. As I, as I tell folks all the time, there's no agenda here. This is not about conversion or religious dogmas and things, um, but it is about relying on, you know, something greater than ourselves to point us to uh, concepts of truth. And I always challenge folks to wrestle with everything that you hear. If you hear something today that doesn't sit right with you, that's fine. Wrestle with it. Um, I'm open for questions. We can dive into it personally. Um, but we just use this as a chance to bring some encouragement into your week and hopefully give you some things to chew on, some things to think about, some things to wrestle with. And and where this is coming from, I'm give it a little bit of a context again. I've shared this with many of you who've been on these calls, but we're constantly getting new folks who are watching this. The team is growing, et cetera. You know, I spent, good gracious, 15 years of my life, uh, college and post-college in the sales environment. Um, I've done everything from door-to-door uh, -door marketing sales. Uh, I've done real estate uh, sales, both um, traditional and non-traditional. I've done um, insurance sales. I was very tied in with the mortgage business. And so I know a lot of these different environments, sales environments, and I know how stressful it can be. And so often in my own life, I ran hard and fast after the sale and the to-do list and all the things that needed to be accomplished. And um, nonetheless, um, that led me to kind of a, a broken spot. And so uh, my book here, Redefine Rich, A New Perspective on the Good Life, is something that John has made available to the team. You guys may or may not have read it. It doesn't matter. Maybe it just looks good sitting on your desk and go, what is, who is that guy with the untied bow tie? Um, actually, a little cool fact. It's, it's this guy here. Um, and so I used to wear a bow tie every Friday. Um, that's another story for another day. But it was kind of an untying of that traditional um, mindset about wealth and prosperity and blah, blah, blah. So hope you guys are doing well. Thank you for letting me um, create some context with, you know, my backstory and, and why we do these conversations this way. So that being said, this week, I want to talk about two different things, um, and I'm trying to figure out a way to tie them together, but that hadn't come to me yet, so if they don't tie together, there's just two different concepts. If they do tie together, then, then great. For those of you who know, we just kind of go, this is, how we, this is how we roll. We jump on, we introduce ideas, we talk through them, and then they're there for us to sit with in the future. The first thing that I need to, to say is more of a confession for me, but I really feel like that it will meet somebody where they are today. Uh, we, as an organization, Uprint, co-founded by myself and my business partner, Kevin Adams. Now, I walked away from a multiple six-figure income a couple of years ago because I felt compelled that this is what I was supposed to do. So there was definitely a spiritual aspect to this where I was like, this is what I think the Lord's calling me to do is to go and start this, this business that's very different, that stands in the gap between kind of Tony Robbins and a preacher. And it ain't about church and it ain't about Tony Robbins, but it's in the middle of, of holistically helping people develop in their spiritual life, in their personal life, in their business. And, and that's the approach that we take to the table. Well, it's been an uphill battle for us because we're doing something that's a little bit outside of the box. People have wanted to wedge us into being a church or being, um, you know, kind of a, a personal development guru for years. And we refuse to do that. And we've got radio programs. Uh, we do corporate chaplaincy programs. Um, I preach sometimes. I do motivational speeches. I do con We do a little bit of everything. And so people, um, you know, are always trying to put us in a box and figure out who we are and what we do. The cool thing is this. All of our work is attached to a nonprofit entity called the Life Center. So the profits from our business go to actually help those that are in need. Um, in the month of January this year, we paid for a single mom's mortgage and were able to get her a couple hundred dollars in groceries. Uh, in the in total of the year last year, we were able to help 81 different individuals in some type of financial capacity, whether that was giving of one-to-one uh, -one time from a counseling perspective to blessing people with a tips program that we have, 
um, to paying for mortgages and, and getting people some needs met so that they could continue to step into who God's called them to be. All of that being said, here's the point of why I'm sharing all of that. I have struggled personally over the past couple of years in finding my value based on outward success. And, and this is what I want to speak to you guys about in a sales environment, because so often our value is attached to outward metrics of success, meaning how many sales did you have? What kind of revenue did you bring in? You know, how many people did you uh, talk with today, etc. And guys, I know this stuff. I have taught this stuff. I speak all over about this stuff but I still struggle to find my value outside of outward metrics. You know, this book, for example, right? This book was declined by nine major publishers because I did not have a large enough following online. Great idea. We love the book, but he's not quite popular enough. And the reality is, that I struggle with that. I struggle with the validation of people, letting people determine your value. And it's interesting because if I told you um, how many cups of coffee will fit in that house? People would be like, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard of. What do you mean how many cups of coffee would fit in that house, right? Um, if I asked you the square footage of the house, you can answer that and that makes sense because it's a valid metric for measuring a house, how many square feet it has. But if I said, tell me what that house and, and cups of coffee, you wouldn't be able to because it doesn't make sense. The same is true of human beings. When we try to measure ourselves um, in ways we weren't intended to be measured, then it just doesn't make sense. But we think it does, you know, say, well, um, you know, how many sales has he made? How many sales has she made? Um, you know, how much revenue have they brought in? You know, what, what's their real value here? You see, when you devalue people and start valuing them by the metrics that they bring, we've made a great error as an organization. Now, there are boundaries that need to be set, and we do have to have um, schedules and structures to say, you know, yes, um, if we're here to sell real estate, then we need to sell real estate but we don't need to value people based on those numbers. And it's more about our own self-worth. You see, so often we find our self-worth and our self-value by how much we bring to the table. And sometimes when that is off, we devalue ourselves, we forget who we are, and we forget that we bring incredible value to the table by just being who we are. Now, underneath this is a big concept of identity. And I think that one of the things that this season is has forced us to hopefully uh, reckon with is our identity. How do we define ourselves? Do we define ourselves by the social groups we participate in? Do we define ourselves by uh, how much money we have in savings in the stock market? Do we define ourselves by our political affiliations? Do we define ourselves by our career? This season has given us a powerful example of how every single one of those things can ultimately fail us. And if our identity is ta attached to something that fails, then our identity becomes challenged. You see, the biggest problem that we face in life and business is truly not knowing who we are because we have identified ourselves in so many different ways that are a validation metric that we were not intended to carry. You are more than the sales you make. You are more than the money you earn. You are more than just being a mom or being a wife or being a manager. You are more than all of this stuff, but we measure ourselves by these things. Um, you know, it's funny, I had written the first book, Redefine Rich, and that was about reconciling our longing for wealth with what true wealth is about. The second book proposal that the big publishers turned down was an idea called CAPES, C-A-P-E-S, the idea um, that we are not designed to be superheroes, right, and wear capes. And the thought process underneath it was superheroes hid their true identity 
by becoming average everyday people. Superman was Clark Kent, right? Um, you know, Batman was Bruce Wayne. I mean, all of these superheroes had average everyday identities that really hid their superpower. But the interesting piece for me in our world today is that so often we actually try to become superheroes because we're afraid of being average everyday individuals. And what I mean by that is we try to kind of maximize our gift set and our value by being, I am super manager, or I am salesperson, right? And it's like, we don't intentionally do this, but we wear these capes that be like, look at me, you know, I'm the top salesperson in the community, you know? And it's like, it's silly, and I'm, I'm being a little bit exaggerated here to really highlight this point that we can't identify ourselves with the things that we do and, 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 and value ourselves with metrics that we weren't supposed to be valued with. So the first, stand, the first thing that I want to say today is, is really do, do the difficult inner work of, of who are you? Who are you really? And I'm going to give you a homework challenge. Uh, we've not really done this yet, but I, I would like to, um, I would encourage you guys to take some time in the next week and write down some characteristics or qualities about yourself. Who are you? Really? Like, how does the environment of a room change when you walk into it? Think about that for a minute. You see, because a lot of times we downplay these things, and I'm going to pick on somebody because I see him on the call here, and that is uh, Brian uh, Sarton, and Brian is uh, uh, here in the, the Wilmington office, and one of the things that I have appreciated about Brian lately is his sense of humor. Uh, Brian, in this whole quarantine environment, has been navigating it um, by doing some really funny stuff uh, via social media channels, and it's hilarious, y'all. And it's, it's really funny because like, I never knew that Brian like had a comedic side, like that he was funny, that he loved to laugh, but that's who that dude is. So when Brian is in an environment where he can't be himself and he can't bring laughter and joy to a room, it's going to cut off part of his identity. And, you know, if somebody's saying, well, Brian, you need to do this and you need to fit in this box and we don't need your laughter here, you're cutting off his arm. Literally, a part of his persona is being restricted. And that doesn't mean he walks into the room every day to be a goofball. He's not the class clown. But that's a huge part of his identity that he needs to explore and express. And we all have these different things about ourselves, you know, uh, whether we love to cook or, or whether we um, love animals. You know, I, I got to do a lot of these interviews um, with some of you guys. And there are some of you, man, you, you love your, your dogs or you love nature. You love your time away. You love your football teams. You love, all of this stuff matters. And it's not just about being a robot selling real estate. And, and once you have a more holistic approach to your identity, then you can thrive and function more holistically and completely in the roles that you um, have within your own communities, within your marriages, within your relationships, etc. So today, I just wanted to start off by saying, go do an assessment of yourself. Go and actually take an assessment of who are you? What is your true identity? Where are you finding your value? Where are you misplacing your value? You know, what are the voices in your head telling you about who you are? I'm not good enough. I got to do more. I got to keep up. You know, think about this and take some time to filter it out and write it on paper. You know, one of the things that we say and teach at Uprint is unless you would engrave it on a plaque and put it on the wall in your living room, do not let it come out of your mouth or do not let it enter your mind. You know, I suck. I'm not good enough. You know, I never get things done. We, these thoughts come into our mind. Imagine if you walked into your house and you saw an I suck banner hanging from your living room wall. Yeah, that is nonsense. You wouldn't want that. You know, and it's not just about positive affirmation. I am valuable. I am worthy. But who are you really? And what are you speaking out of your mouth? What thoughts are you allowing into your head? You have to rewire you, who you are and what you tell yourself as a way to reframe your identity. So that is a, a little bit of, of homework. Now, the other thing that I'm going to share, and if we pull off relating these two, this will be miraculous. If not, so be it. <laughs> so be it. 
Um, I'm actually going to do something I've never done on one of these calls, and I'm going to specifically uh, relate to some biblical scripture. Um, and, and I preface that by saying I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. I'm here to use a, a powerful text um, that we can look at in a fresh way and, and let it speak to us in our life and business. And, and I hope it does that. I'm, I'm going to look today at um, Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 4. Now, the book of Luke uh, was written by a physician uh, whose name was Luke, and Luke was a companion um, to one of the early uh, apostles. And so Luke basically, let me get back to it here, I'm pretty sure it is um, Paul. Yep, so um, Luke was a companion of Paul. And he saw all that he saw, and he wanted to create an account of what he saw. And so that is the book of Luke, okay, what he, what he experienced. Now, in Luke 4, he's talking about a passage that's called the temptation of Jesus. This is recorded in multiple accounts. Jesus, before he began his ministry, it says, was full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, all right? Now, again, I know we've got traditional churchy language and devil and Jesus and all this kind of stuff, but think about this. Here's a man who is going into a wilderness environment to be under temptation, okay? Now, it's interesting. You want to know how long we've been on shutdown right now? About 40 days, pretty close to it, a little bit over 40 days at this point. And I know that you guys have been feeling tension. I know that you've been feeling frustration. When you go through a season, a wilderness season, when things are removed from you, you feel this consternation in your spirit. And that's what Jesus is going through. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. And now he fasted, didn't eat anything for 40 days. So he was hangry, right? My wife gets hangry. My kids get hangry. That's hungry, angry, right? I think Jesus was a little bit hangry, you know? He's depleted. He's frustrated and he's being tempted of all people by the devil. I mean, this is just an incredible context, right? Now, maybe you feel this way. I felt this way during this season. I am in a wilderness season right now. I'm hangry, you know, I'm socially hangry <laughs> and man, I'm being tempted. But why? What's the purpose of it? Why would we be tested? Why would we be tempted? Well, Jesus here is going face to face with his nemesis. He's wrestling with these, these demons, right? The first thing the enemy comes to him and he says, if you're the son of God that everybody says you are, tell this stone to turn into bread. Basically what he's telling him is, why don't you go ahead and provide for yourself? You're frustrated right now. You go be the provider. Isn't that attention in our own lives? To be the provider, to be the one who gets it done. Going back to identity, oh, here we go. This is how this is tied together. Mm, this is so good. Going back to our identity, so many of us find our identity in being the provider. Mm. Man, we find our identity in being the one who is supposed to provide. You see, that's what Jesus is going through here, and maybe this season is teaching that to us as well. Guess who the provider should be? Well, for me, the person of faith, the Lord's supposed to be the provider. I am the conduit by which he provides. I get busy doing those things, but all that good comes from above, right? So here you have this wrestling with, are you the provider? Can you provide for yourself? And Jesus answered, man shall not live by bread alone. Powerful concept, powerful concept. He's hungry and he's saying, bread is not my full identity. Being the provider is not my full identity. So I would challenge you guys to wrestle with that um, in this season as well. You know, what does it look like um, to be wrestling with provision, to let go of the stress of provision, uh, to let go of the fear of being broke or impoverished? You see, these identities, these false identities try to take over who we are and tell us you're not good enough. You got to work harder. You got to be better and all this kind of stuff. And all we're trying to do is be this provider because we're afraid of being broke and being nothing when, you know, I believe we have everything we already need, you know. And, and, and yeah, we get to go and work and get to do these things, but they're not what defines us. So moving on, the, the, the devil then takes Jesus up and shows him the kingdoms of the world. 
And he says, I will give you the praise of all these people. I will give you authority over all these people if you worship me first. And Jesus responds and says, you shall worship the Lord your God alone. Interesting, in this season um, and in, in an identity perspective, how often do we let other people validate who we are? We, we do the things that we do so that other people will approve of us. And yet we forget to be intentional about where true approval comes from. And I think that that's something we need to wrestle with in this identity piece, you know, is where does our value truly come from? Is it in people? Is it what people say about us? Is Do I live my life constantly under the veil of what people say? I know that I've fallen into that trap many years of my life and it led me to a, a broke dead end. And the final piece here, um, you know, the, the enemy and Jesus, they continue this thing here in verse 9. He takes him to the top of the temple and he says, if you're the son of God again, if you're who you say you are, then throw yourself down because it's written that the angels are going to protect you. And Jesus answered him and said, you shall not put your Lord to the test. You see, I think the final piece here is about protection. So many of us find our identity in being our own protector. I'm going to protect my financial future. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save. I'm going to put my money in a good stock portfolio. Ah, the market crashed. And now my identity is gone because I'm not the protector. I never was intended to be the protector. So again, the tie into this and why identity matters and why this passage matters is so many people find their identity in being the provider in the opinions and praise of other people and in being their own protector, comfort, security, things like that. And I think during this season, one of the things we have to wrestle with is how sustainable is it truly? You know, and, and so I just want to challenge you guys to know that your value is more than being a protector. Your value is more than being a provider. And your value is more than what other people say of you. And of anybody, Jesus modeled that for us. We can see a man who went through this. And I love the end of this passage. And it says, and when the test had ended, every temptation had ended, the devil departed from him. You see, a lot of times we got these demons in our head. And we give in to them by focusing on them and we tell, they tell us we're not good enough. You got to work harder. You got to go harder. You got you to make this happen. It's all on you. It's all on you. So-and-so doesn't like you. And, and we work and strive and stress and stress until we burn ourselves out because that's what we're focusing on. But Jesus showed us another way. He showed us another example. I'm going to shift my focus onto what I know to be true, that my identity is not rooted in these things. And it says the devil left him. So maybe stop giving these demons in your head all this authority to, to keep telling you who you are and try to find out who you are underneath that. And so, like I said, from the, from the faith perspective, you wrestle with that however you need to. But I think there's some powerful truth in this and how we can choose in this season to really wrestle with our identity who we truly say we are, what measures of value we're putting on our lives. And friends, you are so much more than a paycheck. You are so much more than money. You are so much more than a provider. You are so much more than a protector. You are so much more than what people say of you. And so I hope that you would use this season to fully step into who it is that you truly are. And certainly am here to help with that in the process. So Thank you all for bearing with me today and letting me connect all these dots. I hope that it was edifying and encouraging to you. As always, you can reach out matt at uprint.life. The phone number is 910-619-4644. See you guys.